All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? Today, I want to discuss a little bit about the historical aspect of pandemics and the different approaches that uh, various types of um, medical doctors and other types of doctors took during these pandemics so that you can get some perspective on why I'm so na passionate about naturopathic medicine and why actually it makes a lot of sense to explore this in this time. The other part of the talk today is going to be uh, kind of a follow-up to some of the really effective, well-studied, well-researched uh, natural medicines. So in my first uh, live session, which if you missed it, you will be able to watch it on YouTube. So you just have to look for my name and you'll see part one on there. And I had discussed about 10 different nutraceuticals that have a very long-standing, uh, good track record of being effective in terms of their antiviral properties. Today I'm going to touch on a few botanicals, so these are um, herbal medicines that have also been in use historically for a very, very long time that show antiviral properties and other attributes in terms of boosting our immune system. And uh, then I'm going to get into stress management and mental health because I had a lot of people you know, sending in requests last time to say, can you discuss what we can do about stress? and about mental health and anxiety in this time. Hi, Taslim. Good to see you again. Um, and so what I would like to do is talk a little bit about that. If we have time, I'm going to go back to talking about hydrotherapy because I'm really passionate about this very traditional naturopathic modality, and I talked about it last time, and we'll just add on a bit more to that. And then I had a couple of requests to talk about fasting because we are about four or five days away from Ramadan for Muslims globally who will be... Uh, observing the, the fasting period, and I'm just going to talk about what could we do or not do in this time. There have been some rumors about controversies to observe the fast. We'll talk a little bit about intermittent fasting. Um, hello, Aruna. Hello, Pranav. Hello, Amrinder. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Um, would be lovely to actually see you guys, but we'll get to that, I'm sure, in future live sessions where I can actually invite you to come in and ask your question live, which would be amazing. So uh, I'm going to teach myself how to do that. Right, so um, info from the CDC, right? The Centers for Disease Control, I believe this would be the American CDC, is predicting that between 50 to 90 percent of all of us will at some point contract the COVID virus. So again, as I mentioned last time, we are still learning about this virus. It's a novel virus. We don't really know how it behaves. Hello, Te. Hello, Shayda Khala. Lovely to see you. And we also don't know how different treatments are actually going to, um, you know, be working with respect to this, this virus. So a lot of the strategies I spoke about last time and today are meant to give us the best ammunition to be able to deal and withstand the effects of the virus should we contract it. Everything I'm discussing here today has not been proven to prevent you from contracting the virus, but I strongly believe that if you adopt some of these strategies, you are basically um, giving the military inside of you the best ammunition to be able to fight this thing and resolve it with uh, your own healing mechanisms, uh, your immune system, and so on. So keep in mind that you know the, the prediction is saying that a lot of us might actually have the virus. Some of us might have it right now, and we don't even know that we have it because we could be asymptomatic. Um, let's talk about some of the historical aspects, right? We've had pandemics before, and all of you will have heard now through all of the news channels that we listen to that the last really devastating pandemic was the Spanish flu, which took place in 1917, 1918. Um, in that time, that, that epidemic, um, obviously we had a lot of medical trained doctors, but we also had other types of doctors that were treating patients, naturopathic doctors, homeopaths, osteopaths, chiropractors, and so on. Um, currently, flu and pneumonia still remain the leading causes of infectious death. And um, when we look back at the Spanish flu, and this is all you know, information that you can find online, the mortality rate of patients who were treated under conventional medical doctors was more than 20%. Okay, so of all the patients that were treated using conventional medical approaches, more than 20% ended up dying. Uh, so medical 
treatment, conventional treatment, obviously has its place. I'm not knocking it. I think that it's really important in various aspects of our lives. Uh, we have had very, very wonderful advances in medical technologies and treatments and surgeries, and so I do believe it has its place. But I also believe that naturopathic medicine and doctors who treat using natural therapies have an advantage in certain cases. And so looking at this historical fact, the mortality rate of patients during the Spanish flu who were treated by naturopathic doctors and by homeopaths, listen to this, was less than 1%. Less than 1% versus more than 20%. Why is this? Why is this that most of those patients who were being seen by naturopathic doctors and homeopaths and osteopaths and so on were more successful at treating this? It's because they were working in harmony with the nature of our physiology. So our body is made and comes from nature. So nature uh, recognizes it. And when we take in the elements of nature, then our body responds to that because our physiology comes from nature. So we have a power within our bodies that is able to heal, resolve, restore health if you give it the right support and the right nutrients. Okay. Um, and what are some of these things that they were using at that time? We're talking 1917, 1918, right? Like a whole century ago. They were basically applying what are called the, the basic tenets, traditional tenets, principles of the nature cure. And they used diet, movement, obviously certain natural medicines, hydrotherapy, rest, and sunshine. Those were the main elements that they were using, and this is how so many of their patients were able to fight the, the virus and resolve, and they had a mortality rate of less than 1%. So in these times right now with the coronavirus and all of the social distancing measures, I still believe that if you can um, utilize some of these elements, you will still be able to stimulate a really good immune response. When we talk about sunshine, so important because that's where you're getting your vitamin D, you need the fresh air, you need the sunlight, okay? Last time I spoke about how the sunlight, when it hits the retina of your eyes in the morning, it actually resets your circadian rhythm. We have biological clocks in different organs of our, our body, and all of those work according to specific rhythms, day, night, light, dark cycles. Melatonin production is also dependent on this. So if you're able to honor the two meter, six feet distancing measures, step outside, get some sunshine every day, get your kids to get some sunshine every day. Um, you know, you, you, you just need 15 minutes, the hands and face, get outside in front of your house or your apartment building. If you've got a backyard or if you've got a garden or you can step into the driveway, so important to, to do this. Um, in the Spanish flu epidemic of 1917-1918, it was common in normal con con conventional medicine not to open any of the windows. So patients were not exposed to fresh air. They were kept confined, which was counterproductive, of course, to them being able to regain their health. And this is one of the things that resulted in some of the negative outcomes. So you need the fresh air. You need the rest. Know that it is okay to rest. And maybe this is one of the gifts of this pandemic for us is to help us to allow ourselves the permission to rest without feeling guilty about it. If you're like me, if I'm resting and it's uh, going on a little bit longer than I would have, you know, scheduled, then I start to feel guilty. But now I'm allowing myself to rest because we need to rest. So I'll get into some of these things a little bit later. Hydrotherapy, if we have time, I'll talk about it because this was a fundamental um, you know, reason that all of these patients in that Spanish flu epidemic managed to resolve the virus is because they were using a very traditional naturopathic modality, um, you know, called hydrotherapy, which uses water in all of its forms. So steam, vapor, hot, cold, ice, and so on to stimulate our physiology to do certain things. Hello, Bashir. Hello, Rima. Hello, Haned. Hello, uh, Namra and so many of you, thank you so much for being here with me today. So to just uh, tag on to some of the discussion last time with natural medicines, well, what kinds of natural medicines, right? What can we do now in this pandemic to give ourselves the ability to actually fight this virus? And again, 
we are looking at a situation where, you know, in the pandemic of the Spanish flu, remember the world war was happening at the same time. So not only did they have this horrible virus that was so devastating, they were also being um, subjected to more stress because of the war. And so it was a situation where the virus was mightier than the sword or mightier than the bullets in some cases, right? And today, you know, the coronavirus has been um, likened to a, a war of, of, with an invisible enemy. And so we need to equip ourselves in a way that we are able to improve our terrain, so our internal physiology, so that this virus does not take hold, hijack our systems, replicate, create more viruses, and lead to a lot of inflammation, in some cases what we call a cytokine storm, which I also spoke about last time. So if you did not catch me last time, I really went into depth and length about the cytokine storm, and you can look at the video on YouTube to understand that. So herbs alone, right, any of the natural medicines alone are not going to necessarily reduce your the chance of contracting the virus. What I am uh, focusing on here is giving our bodies the best ability to deal with the virus. So a uh, couple of herbs that I'm going to talk about today, the first being elderberry. And many of you may have heard of elderberry. It has a long historical use um, in herbalism, in naturopathic medicine. Uh, the Latin name is Sambucus nigra. And uh, it is really well known because of its antiviral attributes. And it's been shown to actually prevent some of these respiratory viruses. So currently there is a little bit of, of um, controversy and, um, you know, the controversy stems from the fact that um, there are people who have been taking preparations that are not um, good quality preparations, and then they are inducing a little bit of a heightened inflammatory response. But this data has not been confirmed. So a lot of natural medicine experts are saying it's fine. Elderberry has been used for such a long time in our history to help us deal with viruses. It's a good idea to use it, but be careful. You can only use the berries or the flowers. With all of the strategies that I'm speaking about here, please do not self-medicate. Please see an expert in naturopathic medicine or functional medicine or an integrative doctor or homeopath who can advise you properly and prescribe exactly the dosages that you need. Okay, so only berries and flowers for the elderberry. And um, this may help a lot with um, the respiratory uh, infections in general. And so the herbs that I'm discussing today all have an affinity for the lungs, meaning they have been known to uh, really help the respiratory system uh, in terms of oxygen perfusion, in terms of gas exchange, in terms of just our ability to fight the actual infection when it hits the lungs, because we know that the coronavirus infects deep into the lungs, right? We, we know this. Olive leaf is another one of my absolute favorites. Olive leaf extract, widely available. Um, and many anecdotal reports show that when it's taken at the onset of a cold or a flu, this can actually shorten the duration of the infection. Okay, so echinacea is also known to do that, by the way, that if you take it right at the onset, um, it will shorten the duration of the of the infection. Um, for people who suffer from sore throat because of the virus, gargling with olive leaf tea can alleviate the symptoms. It can actually decrease the infectivity of the virus. And certain virology researchers have shown that it is it has been shown to be effective against a number of other viruses, such as parainfluenza, the herpes simplex, rhinoviruses, varicella, which is chickenpox, and Coxsackie virus. So olive leaf extract um, can be quite powerful in helping us to just keep that virus at bay and deal with it effectively if we contract it. Another one of my favorites is skullcap. Skullcap is uh, actually, it's also a Chinese medicinal herb. And uh, it is one of these herbs that has really great antiviral properties, but it's also quite calming. So the Latin name is Scatillaria bicalensis, and the active ingredient is bicalin, okay? Has been shown to possess potent inhibitory activity against pathogens. There is a long history. It's been very long studied for its use on viral replication, in particular with the H1N1 uh, virus and also with dengue virus. 
Um, another thing about uh, the skull cap is that in studies using rat models, there was a study where they basically induced COPD, so this is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, which one would normally acquire from long-term smoking. So they exposed these rats to smoke, right? I know, not very nice. And they induced COPD in these rats. And then when they gave them the bicalin, which is the active ingredient of skull cap, um, they saw that their lungs started to improve in terms of their expiratory, inspiratory um, activity, and they were able to remodel how the lungs were um, dealing with the inflammation from the COPD. So, uh, so that's really great. Black cumin. Many of you may have heard of black cumin. It is uh, one of these historical herbs that's been around probably since biblical times. Um, it is uh, very, very uh, well known in the Middle East, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Dubai, so on, uh, the UAE, and many of the Middle Eastern countries, Oman, and so on. But it has a long-standing use also in India and also in Africa. And so it's um, also known as Kalonji. You might have heard of it as Kalonji. Black cumin is also called Nigella sativa. And um, I had done a talk in 2016 in Barcelona where I spoke about H. pylori. And uh, H. pylori is uh, an infection that takes hold inside the stomach. It's one of these bacteria that we possess, all of us possess, but if it grows out of control, it can create a lot of problems, can eventually lead to ulcers, and, and if left untreated, it can lead to a gastric cancer. And Nigella sativa, or black cumin, was one of the, the herbs that was being studied to actually combat this bad bacteria, the H. pylori, which is fantastic. So in this situation, when we talk about the coronavirus, we are seeing that, um, you know, it's been shown to help with the upregulation of natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are our immune cells that go and recognize the pathogen, the virus. They seek it out, they recognize it, and then they recruit other cells to come and deal with that virus to destroy it. So we want to have a good amount of natural killer cells when we're dealing with any viral infection, okay? So um, it has been shown to be effective against the cytomegalovirus. This is another uh, virus. Um, and there's been a study in 2013 where they showed that patients infected with hepatitis C, hep C, when they were treated with black cumin, it, there was a decrease in the viral load, and it also increased um, the oxidative uh, sort of stress uh, potential, meaning it, it, it mitigated against free radical damage to the liver cells. Um, another beautiful thing about black cumin is it's been shown to actually improve glycemic control, so blood sugar regulation in diabetic patients. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about diabetic patients later. In fact, my next Instagram live session, I want to actually focus on um, diabetes and what is happening for diabetics in this pandemic. There is a term called diabesity, which is basically a combination of diabetes and obesity together. And um, I'd like to talk about this. If you've got questions regarding this topic or anything else to do with diabetes, I would love to discuss those at the next session. So let's switch gears now and talk about stress. Okay, so I got a lot of uh, requests to touch on stress, to touch on anxiety, and I would love for you guys to just type up what are you doing in this time to help yourselves mitigate the effects of the stress? Because we are living in unprecedented times where I believe the uncertainty is creating a lot of um, anxiety. For me as well, there are moments where I am anxious because just to share a little bit of my personal story, I am very grateful that I'm here in Canada with my family, but I was actually meant to be in Saudi Arabia with my husband and I couldn't get a flight to get out there to be with him and he couldn't come to be with me. So at the moment we are separated, you know, geographically and uh, don't know when we'll be able to be together again, but I am very grateful that I am with my family here and in a beautiful country like Canada, which I think right now is actually one of the best places to be. So what are you guys doing for stress management in this situation? And before we get into it, there's been a question about neem. Yes, Taslim, neem is really powerful. Also, it's antimicrobial for many different pathogens, so not just viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites. So 
I'm going to touch on a couple more botanicals in this stress and anxiety discussion. There are so many herbs. I just chose a few. There are many others that um, have beautiful properties when it comes to helping um, bolster our immune defenses and uh, helping us with many other aspects of our health. Okay? So Deepak is cooking, dancing, reading. Excellent. Yeah, dancing is a big one for me right now. I'm doing a lot of online videos. Um, to keep fit and most of them have some dance aspect to them. It's just one of the things that I've always enjoyed um, And so that's fantastic uh, Taslim not over scheduling good. That's really important because I think there is this misconception out there that because we're working from home we have more time available and we can have people impose more um, you know expectations upon us and uh, this is problematic. So I'll just, um, Shelly, you're, you're online here. You shared with me yesterday, if you don't mind me mentioning, that although a lot of people have been, um, you know, revealing that this is a time where they are spending time with family and they're playing board games and they're watching movies and they're relaxing and there's a lot of time for reflection and uh, like reading, like some of you have said, or what have you, for some other people, they feel more stressed out in this time. Why? Because not only are they having to work from home, but now they've got kids that they're having to deal with their homeschooling schedules and looking after them and making sure that they're fed and that they're well taken care of. And so people are being pulled in different directions, even though they're, they're working from home. And in some cases, they're actually working more hours than they would have been if they were in the office because once you go into the office, you do your job and you clock out at, when it's time to leave and you go home and then you can kind of shut off maybe, I hope, in most cases. So really important to create those boundaries, really, really important. Maybe this is one of the gifts for a lot of us is to look at how we can create boundaries um, because health is not just an absence of disease and it's not just an absence of physical disease. Health is also about mental, emotional, spiritual health, right? Um, Rima says, working out, awesome. Shelly, baking, yes, you are a master baker by now, I'm sure. Um, puzzles, fantastic. Gardening, that's great. So really important to be engaging in activities or doing things that we normally wouldn't have otherwise had time to do. Now is the time. Now, remember that, you know, with the stress response, what's happening is when you're feeling stressed out, there is a hormone that is basically released called cortisol. Cortisol is a friend. Usually we need cortisol. It is the one hormone that helps us to deal with any fight or flight response, okay? But if you have ongoing spikes of cortisol and it's never coming down, you're never actually being able to bring those cortisol levels down, this becomes a problem because then it starts to create inflammatory situations in the body and it starts to create um, a susceptibility to infection. We don't want this. So please appreciate that stress impacts your immune response. And even though you may not feel like you're stressed, the body takes it on. So we got to keep a check on, on the cortisol levels. There is a test that I do. If anybody's interested, um, please reach out to me. It's a really, really intricate, beautiful test. It's just done with salivary and urine samples. And it looks at all of your reproductive hormones, all of your sex hormones, but also your full stress hormone uh, production and how it's being modulated through the day and how it's being used in your system. So I can see if people have erratic cortisol output and then there are certain things we can do to help you with that. So, you know, if, if we're having high cortisol and lots of stress, we are interfering with the body's ability to produce white blood cells. We need those white blood cells because those are the soldiers that are going around patrolling the system all the time to ensure that there are no pathogens and if they are, they know how to get rid of them. So in this uh, section of my discussion, I wanted to then touch on a couple of herbs that I use for people who are feeling really stressed out or really burnt out or really, you know, just feeling kind of like overwhelmed and lots of anxiety. And um, the adrenal glands, which are like thumb-sized glands that sit on top of the kidneys, they are the ones that are responsible for releasing the cortisol anytime you are faced with a stressor. The stressor could be waiting in a long line out to get into a shop in the freezing cold. The stressor could be trying to deal with, you know, getting your kids their lunch before you get on a conference call. It could be sitting in traffic. It could be actually dealing with a, a loved one who's infected, okay, in these times. 
So these herbs are called adaptogens. And why are they called adaptogens? Because they help you to adapt. They mount a response that helps you to adapt to the stressful situation, okay? So these adaptogenic herbs are very well known for their immune boosting effects, as well as their ability to help um, the body to survive harsh conditions. So um, botanicals that we're gonna talk about today are adaptogenic herbs, but they're also known to have antiviral properties. So what are some of these botanicals? Um, medicinal mushrooms, you might have heard of certain mushroom uh, species that are fantastic for boosting the immune system and also for helping with adrenal health. Okay, so yes, the question is adrenal fatigue and thyroid, same herbs, not necessarily. That's a topic for a whole other day and I hope I'll be able to talk about that. Um, the thyroid gland requires different kinds of herbs but whenever I treat the thyroid I always treat the adrenal glands okay because they're very intimately linked and when the thyroid is uh, not functioning well it, then you know the adrenals are kind of um, sort of uh, impacting the thyroid function and so you always have to make sure you're treating both. So what I'm talking about here are herbs that are well known for the stress response but also have some antiviral immune boosting properties. So we're sort of killing two birds with one stone. So going back to the mushrooms, you will have heard of reishi, shiitake, cordyceps, turkey tail. These are all a beautiful mushroom species that have been shown to have very powerful medicinal properties, especially when it comes to dealing with things like cancer and um, any other types of infections. And so, you know, again, please seek out a an expert in natural medicine to help you deal with um, your specific issues if you're interested in taking any of these. I'm just going to highlight turkey tail mushroom um, because it in particular has been shown to produce something called beta-glucans. Beta-glucans are immune fighting uh, molecules, okay? Um, it has been used for centuries in eastern parts of the world, in Asia, in Japan in particular, to strengthen the immune system. Um, and it's given in different protocols to this day to help uh, improve the immune function. So there have been a few studies showing that it activates your immunity, but it also modulates your immunity so that you don't get that hyper response and end up with a cytokine storm, which we don't want. My absolute favorite adaptogenic ver herb, which has antiviral properties, Tulsi, holy basil. Love this herb. You can get it in a tea bag form. And whenever possible, I do drink this, um, you know, just as a, a calming herb. It's really wonderful for calming you without sedating you. Um, it is an adaptogen, but it also has antiviral attributes and um you know, when we talk about the coronavirus, as I keep saying, we, we don't want to strengthen the immune system so much that you get a hyper response. You want just enough to deal with this virus, okay? So Tulsi has been shown to modulate the immune system in this way. Um, and it kind of slows down a hyper immune response. It is antibacterial. As I said, it's very calming as well. It's that's in, in naturopathic terms that is described as a nervine. So it helps a lot with anxiety. Just sipping on a Tulsi tea whenever you're feeling anxious is really helpful. Um, it's been used as an antidepressant. And you know, Tulsi is a very intuitive herb. So it does what the body needs in that time. And in doing that, it also helps to balance the immune system. So if possible, get Tulsi. Tulsi is widely available in most Indian households as well in India. It's a revered herb. So um, I really believe in its, in its uh, properties. Licorice root, another one with a strong, strong affinity for the lungs. Okay. It has been used in many combination antiviral formulas. So you could use licorice root uh, in combination with echinacea, in combination with elderberry or so on. Again, the formulation would have to be made by an expert, okay, in a tincture form. You can sip on it like a tea, which is great if you love the taste of licorice. Um, and it's been shown to soothe, moisten, and reduce inflammation in the lungs and particularly in the throat. Um, it was used during the SARS epidemic um, and other coronavirus infections, and it has been shown to actually inhibit the replication of the virus. Now, just a precaution here with licorice root. If you're somebody who has a risk for developing high blood pressure 
or you already have high blood pressure. Licorice root is not meant to be used long term. So it can be used for short term periods, but you got to really watch because it has the potential for spiking up the blood pressure. So I've actually used this in patients who have low blood pressure to bring their, their BP up. So please be careful about that. It can lower potassium levels and potassium is also really important for the heart. So another reason why if you take it as a tea, it's more gentle, but if you're going to take it as a capsule or as a tincture, you need the advice of a doctor for that. So. Talking about stress and anxiety, you know, um, there are lots of digital wellness tools that we can look at exploring. Um, I particularly have started using for quite a few months now, before even this pandemic came to light, um, an app called Calm. Some of you may have heard of this app, and it's got these beautiful meditation um, stories and bedtime stories and things to help you with deep breathing exercises and so on. And so I usually use it at the end of my day. Um, I will, you know, put it on about 10, 15 minutes just to help get my brain and my central nervous system into a calm state ready to tell my body it's time to sleep, right? So this is called sleep hygiene. When you get into a routine, telling your body it's time to sleep because sleep is so, so important for immunity. There are many other mindfulness-based um, apps out there. Headspace is another one, I believe. Um, you know, so just explore these things and see what works for you. Today, I wanted to just quickly show you a beautiful technique that has been used for centuries and centuries when it comes to deep breathing and meditation. It's called alternate nostril breathing. Have you guys heard of alternate nostril breathing? And what it is, is you're basically inhaling and exhaling through one nostril at a time. And it's the fastest way to stimulate your body into coming into the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic part of our nervous system is your fight or flight. It gets the body ready to deal with a stressor or to fight it. Or in some cases now they're saying fight, flight or freeze, right? And then it has to come down. All of that has to finally recover, and that's where the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in. So what's alternate nostril breathing? Yalisha, you're doing this every day, fantastic. You're going to take your thumb and your pinky finger, okay? I'm just going to show it to you. You can please do it with me. We'll just do it for maybe 30 seconds, and it's something you can do anytime, and it really helps you to relax. So you're going to use the thumb, block the right nostril, okay? When you do that, you're going to then inhale through the left nostril, use the pinky, block the left, and exhale out of the right nostril. Keep the pinky finger on the left nostril, Ex inhale again through the right nostril, block it, exhale out of the left nostril. So let's do two rounds of this, okay? If you guys can just do it with me, I think that'd be great. So we'll do two rounds uh, of the alternate nostril breathing. Right, so you got it? thumb and pinky finger. Let's start with the right thumb onto the right nostril. Inhale. Block. Exhale. Inhale again. Block. Exhale. Okay, that's one round. If you do about eight, nine rounds of this, and you do it in a really deliberate, conscientious way, you know, in a place where you can actually take the deep breaths, you know, stretch out the, the inhale and the exhale as long as you can. It's a really wonderful way to calm your anxiety. So there may be other versions of the same technique. You can please share those um, if you like. So meditation, deep breathing, these are all things that we know that have a profound impact on our immune systems right? Because they help to mitigate how the immune system is going to work. They create um, an alkaline pH within the blood because we're bringing oxygen into the body and the, the oxygen is so important because a lot of pathogens cannot survive in an oxygenated environment. And you're improving your lung function. That's what we want in this time. We want to improve our lung function so that these breathing exercises are going to help the lungs um, to fight this thing and to help us not to get into those acute distress uh, syndromes of, of respiration. Um, but many of us are still freaking out. Many of us are really anxious. You know, we just don't know what's going to happen. We're having financial issues. Many of us have lost our jobs or have been forced into unpaid leaves. We don't know how we're going to pay for basic necessities. And I know that there have been beautiful, um, you know, acts and gestures from communities. And in some cases, governments are helping. So that helps. 
Um, but um, I think, you know, what comes to mind is something that just happened yesterday here in Canada, which was a mass shooting in Nova Scotia. And uh, it's so tragic and it's so sad and we still don't know what the motivation was behind it. But I think there were upwards of 20 people that were killed in this mass shooting in a rural community. And Nova Scotia is known for being such a laid back, um, beautiful you know, uh, province. So it's really shocking for the nation. But what I am wondering is if some of the stress of the pandemic, um, you know, has been amplified in people who are already dealing with anxiety, depression, and other kinds of mental health issues, right? It is possible that all of the restrictions and all of the issues that are going on could be amplifying uh, these kinds of conditions. And so it's so important to make use of some of the mental health resources available out there. I believe there are apps where you can get counseling if you need to, reach out, talk to somebody. Um, but talking to each other, making sure that although we're isolated, we're still connected is really important. And self-care. Self-care is actually not a luxury. It's a priority right now. We need to really make time to take care of our own self, of filling up our cup, so that we can then be there in, in you know, the, the times of need for our elderly parents or our kids or other friends and so on. Um, there is an app called 10% Happier. I've checked it out. It's pretty cool. They have every day at a certain time daily meditation and what they call sanity practices to keep you sane during this pandemic. One of the things that um, they really advocate a lot is the practice of gratitude. And I'm sure many of you are already doing that, but it has been shown scientifically that when you genuinely have feelings of gratitude and you express gratitude through prayer or, you know, internal conversation or talking to people, it actually changes the levels of the cytokines um, in your system that are the ones that modulate inflammation and help fight infection. So what are some of my favorite things to do in this time? Well, sleep. I'm getting a lot of sleep, which is fantastic. I love my sleep. Um, I have been able to just, you know, do a bit more with some of my creative energy when it comes to things like painting, adult coloring books, which I love. Um, I really wish I could get a massage, but that's not possible right now. And um, my sister has a an organic chicken farm um, about an hour away from here, and it's beautiful spending time up there because it's nature, it's the countryside, it's, you know, the chickens and just being in that environment for me has been very relaxing. So I really encourage all of you to practice, you know, all of the stuff, gratitude, talking to each other, staying connected, making the time every day to do something that's just for yourself, that it brings you a little bit of joy and helps you to feel calm because it's impacting your immune system. It's impacting your cortisol output. So super important. Remember that love is great medicine. Um, you know, feeling love feeling nurtured and, and taken care of and kind gestures that we can do for each other, believe it or not, they actually impact the um, expression of genes that are involved in antiviral defenses. So the love is the drug. It's, it's really one of the best ways to help us in this case. Um, so I would like to ask the question, what is the message? What is the gift in this pandemic for you? What is it that you're learning or have discovered that you didn't know before um, that can actually be a positive in this time? Because there are many people out there, spiritual teachers and philosophers who believe this virus has come to us as a way of cleansing, as a way of detoxing, not just physically, but also mental, emotional detoxes, as a way of, um, you know, really focusing on the things that are important in life. It's kind of the corrector or the equalizer. Do you feel this way? What are your thoughts on this? And what are the gifts for you? So Taslim says gift of time. Sure, absolutely, right? We're always running around. We always complain we don't have enough time. Now we have the time, but the question is, how are we using that time? So can you look for the intelligence in this message for you? You know, um, because fear in itself is, is a pandemic. And when you are allowing yourself to engage in fear-based thoughts and conversations, 
then unfortunately what we're doing in that situation is we're allowing it to cloud our judgment and our emotional intelligence, actually. So that's why I spoke about the Spanish flu at the beginning of this talk, because that was really devastating. That killed upwards of 50 million people globally. Um, so now we have all these beautiful technologies around us, like me talking today. We wouldn't have been able to do this, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And you're able to now just get all this information and, um, and basically um, help yourself to be mightier than the virus, right? At the moment with the pandemic, it's the survival of the fittest. So if you're fitter, more fit than the virus, you will win. Uh, time with little ones, time for spirituality, absolutely. Um, you know, time with family. A lot of you are saying time with family. So I'm really happy that this is the gift for you. Getting time to explore things about yourself, maybe do things that you didn't have time to do before that um, are safe to do. That's really fantastic. So um, I'm going to just get into a little bit of, um, I think let's talk about the fasting. If we have time, I'll come back to the hydrotherapy. Um, talking about spirituality, you know, it's uh, one of those things right now, four or five days from now, about 1.8 billion Muslims around the world are going to be observing the fast. Um, fasting has been part of many, many religious practices since time immemorial. So not just Muslims, but Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, there's always been this element of fasting, of cleansing, but it's also meant to be a time for more God consciousness, right? So along with religious fasting, there have been other types of therapeutic fasts, intermittent fasting being one of them. So how have you guys explored intermittent fasting. I know some of you are experts with, with this now. Um, and what are the thoughts, right? This has been the question. Is it a good time to get into intermittent fasting? And um, we know there is lots and lots of evidence out there because intermittent fasting as a naturopathic doctor was something we were prescribing decades ago before it became, you know, kind of popular in the last, uh, in the recent years. But it shows that it's a way of prolonging life. It's really anti-aging. It's pro-longevity because it spruces up your DNA. Um, you get um, these different reactions to the body that lower inflammation. So remember, the more inflamed you are, the higher at risk you are for uh, getting diseases, infections, and it's also very, very, um, it's, a, it's a kind of an acceleration of aging. We, we, who wants that? We all want as much as possible to, to, you know, to kind of push back the time. What's interesting about fasting, though, is it also cuts insulin levels. It helps to bring down normalized blood sugar levels. So of course, diabetic, diabetic, diabetic. That's what I'm, I'm talking to you. If anybody who has insulin resistance, anybody who is you know, on the borderline of, of pre-diabetes, and i just like to point out that a lot of us are on that insulin resistance border, and a lot of it has to do with just the modern day lifestyle that we're living, the foods that we're eating, the rushing around, running around all over the place. Some of you have just indicated here that one of the gifts of this pandemic is no stress of rushing around. Like, there's no schedules. Um, you know, you don't have to run around and, and being late all the time. Um, this is a great time for spending time on detoxing. And, um, Maybe for some of you, it might be the opposite. Like I have other people who have told me, uh, one of my best friends did mention to me that she's finding that she's just got um, an over-scheduled agenda at the moment. So, you know, you need to reflect on that. So for all of my diabetic patients, all of them, wherever possible at some point in their protocol, I am prescribing intermittent fasting. Okay, but I do it for a lot of people because of all of these benefits. It helps to lower blood pressure as well. Now, as I said, Ramadan is coming up. There's been some controversy and confusion for many Muslims regarding their obligation to fast this Ramadan because of the pandemic. Why? Because a lot of authorities are telling us that we need to keep the throat moist. We need to keep the mucous membranes moist. We need to stay hydrated to be able to, you know, do the best we can to ward off the virus. Though that is true, it hasn't been proven. A lot of these things that we're talking about have yet to be proven because this is still fairly new. So what do you do if you've got to drink water and when you're fasting as a Muslim, you're not allowed to drink water because you're basically fasting between sunrise and sunset. Um, 
So, of course, it's a logical question. It makes sense. But unfortunately, there are all kinds of rumors going around saying, oh, I think we're not going to need to be fasting this year. So I just wanted to talk about it because I had a, a good friend of mine, Rami, who had brought this question to the table. And there are many people in some of the countries where I see patients who, who are wondering about this, like what, what is going to happen? Um, does fasting right now pose a risk of actually catching the COVID-19, right? So, um, you know, there's the possibility that people are starting to feel, well, if I can't drink water all the time and keep hydrating, um, I'm going to be more susceptible to catching the virus. We'll discuss that. Now, um, just to go back, there's a question about intermittent fasting. You know, what exactly is it? So it's usually fasting in a specific window of time. That means you give yourself only eight hours in the day where you're eating whatever you're going to eat. And the other 16 hours you are not eating. You can drink beverages that have, you know, very low calories, but um, you cannot eat. So what most people do or what I recommend is you eat your dinner early-ish. You go to bed. Obviously, you're fasting while you're sleeping. You skip breakfast, but you just have it much later. So if you basically were to start fasting, let's say at 8 p.m. at night, and then you finish your last meal, you go to bed, 8 a.m., that's 12 hours. That's already 12 hours, okay, that you haven't eaten. You just got to add another four hours to get into 16 hours, so your first meal would be at noon. And then you only have between noon and 8 p.m. to eat. That's one way of doing it. Some people do a 5-2. Five 5-2 two. Five two means they're eating their normal way of eating for five days out of the week. And then there's two specific days where they eat only 500 calories. So they're really putting an emphasis on just eating things that are going to help detox or basically more of a liquid fast or however different you know versions that you want to do it. Is this a time to start intermittent fasting if you've never done it? My response is, Maybe not if you've never done it, but can you explore it? Yes, you can start looking at ways of intermittent fasting. Maybe start off with a 12-hour fast and then push to the 16 hours. Those of us who've been doing it for a long time, you can easily push to 16 hours. You can push to 18 hours, but you have to be a seasoned intermittent faster um, because initially you're going to have detox reactions that can be a little bit challenging to deal with. Um, hello Nizam, hi Mel, beautiful to see you on here, Kayleen, great to see you um, from South Africa, and uh, so I just want to caution people that exploring is a good idea, but getting into a hardcore intermittent fast, if you've never done it before, you might want to rethink. Um, remember that when you're intermittent fasting, you are doing what's called metabolic switching. So after the body's used up glucose for fuel, it's going to switch into ketones, which are your fats. It's going to start to break down your fats into ketones and use that for fuel, and that's the preferred fuel of the body. And in so doing, the added benefit is there's fat loss, but you can spare your muscle mass um, as well. And... Uh, you know, the, the ketogenesis, meaning this uh, whole process of using ketones for fuel, when the ketones are in the bloodstream, they initiate a, a variety of cellular mechanisms that actually signal health, signal anti-aging, signal metabolic function. So this is why intermittent fasting is, is becoming quite popular. Now, um, we know that diabetics and other people with metabolic disorders are at higher risk Right? right now, they're at higher risk, not only for contracting the virus, but for more negative outcomes. And I spoke a lot about that last time. I'll speak about it again at my next session. Um, most of this is due to the heightened inflammatory response that's creating a cytokine storm. So an exaggerated influx or flood of all of these inflammatory mediators, which then just jam up the system. They overwhelm the immune response and it spirals out of control and you get the edema. You get the respiratory distress. It impacts the cells in the lungs, the pneumocytes that are responsible for oxygen perfusion. So people have difficulty breathing. And fasting has been shown to mitigate the way that these inflammatory cells and immune cells work and to lower inflammation. Okay? So, as I said, you know, there are many of us that are going to start fasting in a few days uh, for religious reasons. 
and uh, lots of confusion about whether it's a good idea or not a good idea because um, all these religious authorities are also being asked the same question. Now with Ramadan, there are certain exceptions. If, if you're sick, if you feel you know, under the weather or you are actually sick, you're exempt. Menstruating and pregnant women, to a certain extent pregnant women, are exempt. The elderly are exempt. So um, if you're on medications for a chronic illness, you're probably going to need to take those medications throughout the day, you're exempt. Um, but there was a very interesting article, a couple of articles that I looked into, uh, one in 2017 in the journal Frontiers of Immunology, specifically looking at fasting and fasting during Ramadan. And what they found is an immunomodulatory effect, meaning it does to the immune system what the immune system requires in that moment. And it um, basically helps with the release of certain cytokines, right? Your interferons, interleukins, CRP. These are things I spoke about last time. But what I thought was really interesting is when you fast, it actually amplifies, it increases the ability of the macrophages to come and engulf the pathogen and kill it. Uh, so that's fantastic. It shows improvements in lipid profiles for, for cardiac patients. Um, of course, there's a huge link between gut health and mental well-being when we're fasting. Uh, one of the things that fasting does is it releases something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Some of those of you who are health professionals will know this. Um, BDNF is a really powerful molecule released by the brain. It is protective for the brain. It's actually been shown to reduce depression. It's been shown to protect against certain kinds of mental health disorders like dementia, um, anxiety, and it also reduces anxiety in general. Um, so there's another article that said the same sort of benefits of fasting um, just written in April, like literally a few days ago, in the Annals of Thoracic Medicine. So you can certainly check those out. What would be my suggestions then, after all of this research and my own personal experience? So in light of all of the immune enhancing effects with respect to modulating how the cytokines are released, how your body mounts an inflammatory response, the increase in macrophagic activity, I would say that there's a low risk of contracting the COVID-19. Okay, if the issue is hydrating, remember, you're not fasting ongoing. You're going to eat at sunrise and again at sunset. So you can just improve your hydration, you know, just uh, increase your hydration rather at those times. Um, there are two little tips I have as far as uh, food and drink that I've used in the past and I think they help. One is um, a drink that I encourage people to make and drink either in the beginning of the fast um, or later on after they've broken their fast and it's using chia seeds and uh, there's a drink called a lemon infused chia seed drink which is beautiful because all you do is it's water you dump in a tablespoon of chia seeds you leave it for an hour two hours or longer the chia seeds basically swell up because they're holding all of this water they expand because they take up all the water you can add a little bit of apple cider vinegar or some raw honey or you can add some lemon you know, stir it up, drink it. Now what happens is that those chia seeds contain all the water. So while you're fasting, the chia seeds start to release the water and keep you hydrated. Another very traditional food that I grew up with and I know is very popular in the eastern part of the world, in the Middle East, in India, in Pakistan, and so on, is faluda. You might have heard of this. I grew up in Kenya, in East Africa, and we had this all the time, in particular during Ramadan, and I could never understand why because it was more like a milkshake or a, or a dessert. But again, the reason is because the faluda is made from the, this type of agar, agar gel, which again, absorbs water. You can add basil seeds into it, and the basil seeds also expand and hold water, so it's very hydrating. Um, I want us to just think about how we're breaking our fast, whether it's intermittent fasting or fasting for religious reasons. Unfortunately, during Ramadan, it's very common to eat foods that are high in sugars, high in you know, fats and fried foods and pastries and samosas and all these beautiful rich foods, but they're not doing very much for our immune function. And I did mention last time that sugar for now, right now in this pandemic is probably 
uh, one of the, the easiest ways to decrease your immune function and become susceptible for the virus to get in. So think about how you're eating when you break your fast. What are you starting off with at the time of breaking the fast? I really encourage people to break the fast with some bone broth or some kind of soup, um, you know, with some vegetables or herbs, you know, warm drinks, even just warm water with lemon initially. And, uh, you know, after a little while, then you can get into eating and ensure that your food contains mostly whole produce, good quality, uh, full of antioxidant um, and full of anti-inflammatory properties. So your vegetables and, and your good quality protein, healthy fats, all of those things are important. You need to stay away from processed foods as much as possible. So I hope that is helpful. And um, I hope that, you know, given these uh, thoughts that people will not be too scared to fast. Just keep in mind there are certain populations that are exempt from the fasting. And I believe that kind of brings me to the end of my talk today. I really, really appreciate all of you being with me. I wanted to touch on hydrotherapy, but I don't have too much time to discuss that, so I'll talk about it next time. But I'll just leave you with this, that um, in the previous pandemics, one of the things that was not interfered with was fever. I spoke about this last time as well, and I spoke about the importance of fever. So, you know, in the pandemics and in a lot of conventional medical approaches, we're constantly stopping the fever. Fever is the first line of defense. It's the way that the body mounts a response to deal with the pathogen. And um, it's important to appreciate that we need to harness the, the fever in such a way that supports the body to fight the infection, okay? So Hippocrates, who's the father of medicine, he actually said, success sometimes depends not on just what the doctor does, but also on what he doesn't do. And I wanted to talk a little bit about different ways of harnessing the fever um, with hydrotherapy. So, you know, using things like cold and wet packs on the torso, on the throat, on the abdomen. And there's a beautiful uh, naturopathic hydrotherapy treatment called cold wet socks or magic socks um, so i think what i'll do is i'll just do a post on it and you can certainly look for that and it's a great way of dealing with any upper respiratory issues any respiratory issues just whenever you're feeling under the weather involves unfortunately using really really cold socks that have been drenched in freezing cold water wringing them out putting them on your feet and then putting on two pairs of woolen socks on top of that warm socks covering your